Welcome to this event in the fall semester 2021 virtual series, Assessing China's Belt and Road Initiative, hosted by the Party School of Global Studies at Boston University. The Party School's mission is to promote and communicate interdisciplinary research on globally important long-term issues that affect the human condition. I'm Grant Rode of the Center for the Study of Asia, here to introduce our topic and speakers. Our topic today, significant and timely, is China's economic relations with the Levant region. Our speakers are professors Nader Habibi and Adil Abdul Ghaffar and think tank analyst, Ms. Sophie Zinzer, who we hope will be able to join us shortly. Dr. Habibi, author of key articles on China's BRI involvements in the Middle East, is currently conducting research on China's economic involvement in the Eastern Mediterranean, which provides current sources for his remarks today focused on the Levant. He is the Henry J. Lear Professor of Practice in the Economics of the Middle East at Brandeis University's Crown Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Following his presentation, Dr. Gaffar and Ms. Sinzer will make discussant remarks. Dr. Gaffar is a fellow at the Brookings Doha Center and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in Qatar, specializing in political economy. Ms. Sinzer trained at Tsinghua University in Beijing and is a Schwarzman Academy Fellow in the Middle East North Africa program at London's Chatham House. Following the presentation and discussant remarks, we will open the session to a question and answer period for the remainder of our 60 minutes. To ask a question, hit the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Please type in your name and affiliation and then your question. It will be easier for me as moderator to keep track of the questions if your questions in the Q&A tab rather than in the chat tab. We warmly welcome our speakers today. Many thanks for their willingness to share their experience by talking to us about Chinese economic activities in the Levant region. I'm pleased to turn the mic over to you, Professor Habibi, for presentation of your current research. Uh, thank you and uh, good morning. Uh, I hope everyone can uh, see me and uh, see my picture uh, because I don't, uh, see the screen. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rode, for the opportunity to uh, participate in this program. Uh, I have been uh, tracking the uh, economic relations between China and Middle Eastern countries. Uh, for nearly eight years, I began with a focus on the uh, Persian Gulf region, the GCC countries, and Iran. Uh, because uh, it was my understanding that the primary interest of China in the Middle East is because of its uh, immense natural gas and uh, uh, crude oil reserves. Therefore, I started from that region. And last year, I completed a report on China's relations with the uh, uh, Middle Eastern uh, countries that export oil, primarily around the, the Gulf region. Um, in order to understand whether China's the relations with the other MENA countries is any different because they uh, do not have, uh, uh, just one second, uh, do not export oil. I, um, I decided to look at other regions. And um, uh, I began with looking at Levant because I, I noticed that other colleagues such as uh, uh, Dr. Abdul Jafar had already looked at North Africa. Uh, so I decided to see whether the large countries of Levant, such as Turkey and Egypt, would uh, have any different type of uh, economic relationship with China. And now that China has introduced its uh, global uh, economic engagement strategy, which is known as the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so I began this research and today I'm going to present to you some of the uh, general regional findings of uh, my research. In uh, Generally, when we study China's relations with um, various regions, we focus on bilateral relations with specific countries. But uh, uh, today, I thought I'll just, because of the limited time, focus on the broader regional picture to see if there are any uh, common characteristics to China's uh, engagement with the Levant region. And for this, I have prepared a uh, um, PowerPoint presentation. I'd like to share that with you and uh, continue my uh, talk. Okay. 
architecture. So as you can see, here is the map of the um, Levant subregion of Middle East. And the countries that I'm going to focus on today are um, Turkey, Syria, Jordan, Israel and the uh, Palestinian region, Lebanon and Egypt. These uh, five countries and the Palestinian territory. And I'm going to focus on two aspects of China's economic relations with this region. These two aspects are bilateral trade and uh, Chinese investments in, in the region. Um, of course, there could be bilateral investment, such as some uh, countries also investing in the um, in China, some of these countries. But uh, today, I'm just going to focus on the um, investments of China in the Levant region. Um, the, the region has a, a strong diversity, as you can see, some very large countries, some very small ones, countries such as Turkey and Egypt with uh, uh, more than 80 million population, Egypt practically approaching 100 million. So uh, just a very brief introduction about the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, China introduced this uh, initiative in 2013. Originally, it was called the Silk Road, but it has gone through several name changes. Um, one way of measuring its progress is to look at the number of countries that have signed agreements with China um, strategic agreements or any kind of bilateral agreements, which are framed as Belt and Road Initiative agreements. And uh, as of 2020, the number of these agreements was uh, 138 countries had joined, which is a quite a large number of people, uh, countries, and uh, 57 countries had not joined. When you look at the um, Middle East, you can see practically all countries other than the Israel, Jordan, and Syria and Lebanon have signed some type of a cooperation contract with China in this framework. Of course, the uh, motivations for, of China for initiating this global engagement are, uh, have been studied in detail, but very briefly, uh, China had, it was very successful in exporting manufacturing goods to the rest of the world. And as a re result, it has accumulated a huge amount of uh, hard currency, foreign exchange surplus. At the same time, it developed a very strong engineering capacity as it was developing its own infrastructure and building um, manufacturing capacity. And now many of those investments inside, the, uh, inside China have been completed and there is a huge surplus which uh, could be used in other countries. Uh, China's uh, unique feature in terms of diplomatic relations with the rest of the world is that it uh, is committed to non-intervention and non-interference in affairs of other countries which has uh, proven uh, very successful in uh, gaining the trust of uh, various diverse countries around the world, uh, which have had some dark experiences of European colonialism or European and American interventions after World War II. Um, I start with a, an overview of investments that China has made in uh, the Levant region. Uh, as you can see, uh, this uh, data uh, offers investments in a number of uh, sectors, economic sectors. And one of the surprising results that we observe here is that even though the Levant region is not an oil and gas exporter, we see that China's investments in energy in these countries are uh, larger than uh, its investments in any other sector. And nearly um, um, almost 45% of China's investments are in energy and uh, the, the largest recipients of energy investments are Egypt and uh, Turkey. In Turkey, these investments are primarily for development of uh, uh, coal power plants and renewable uh, energy uh, power plants in that country. Um, Looking at the parameter of diversity, we see that China's investments in Egypt are more diverse than any 
other country. And also Egypt is the recipient of the largest amount of Chinese investments during 2006 and 2020. Also, when we look at the share of Levant in the Middle East, we see that this share is about 24% um, of overall Chinese investment in this period. Um, in terms of population, obviously having the countries like Turkey and Egypt means that the share of uh, Levant in the region in terms of population is uh, larger than that amount. Now, some people include uh, Iraq in the Levant. That's another way of defining Levant. I wanted to present this um, alternative picture of investment to show you that uh, if we include Iraq, um, most of the Chinese investments in Iraq are focused on energy as expected. Uh, China is uh, heavily committed to expanding Iraq's oil and natural gas sector. And since it is not stable and secure enough for Western oil companies, uh, Chinese have been able to um, make significant uh, the progress in investing in that country relative to others. And including Iraq, we see that uh, almost 45% of the Chinese investments in the um, Levant, in the Middle East, have been invested in the Levant region. Looking at uh, relative uh, shares of investment of China in Levant and another uh, concentrated and important region of the Middle East, which is the um, Gulf Cooperation Council countries, uh, those six small oil exporting countries, uh, Arab oil exporting countries around the Persian Gulf, we see that in both regions, Chinese investments have been gradually increasing, although they are erratic from year to year. But because of the um, COVID-19 pandemic, in both regions, the investments have declined considerably in 2020. The decline in the Levant region has been uh, more significant than GCC. That is why if we look at the relative share of Levant and GCC in China's investments, we see that in these uh, final two years, uh, GCC has uh, attracted a very uh, large amount, although the total amount is small, and the share of Levant has been relatively minuscule. And I have here for you the names of six GCC countries that I have presented here for comparison. Okay, what about trade? Looking at the uh, uh, exports and imports of uh, Levant region with China, we see that like many other regions in the world, the, the uh, trade has expanded rapidly ever since year 2000. And also that uh, the Levant's imports from China have increased at a, a faster rate than its exports to China, primarily because Levant does not have oil and natural gas for export. And as a result, the gap between these two, the trade deficit has been large and has continued to remain relatively significant um, ever since year 2006. Uh, so this means that China has accumulated a large amount of uh, trade surplus with regard to the Levant region. And that surplus is has turned into investment by China in the region. So one of the sources of these investments is China's trade surplus, which is also true with rest of the world. Again, comparing the uh, trade of Levant with GCC countries, we observe that uh, although GCC is a relatively small part of the Middle East, with a small population that uh, approaches almost 50 million, we see that the trade with GCC in terms of both imports and exports exceeds the Levant region. Especially if, the look, look, if you look at the lower corner graph, you see that the, uh, um, the, the, the imports, the exports of Levant are really very small compared to the GCC, which has exported something in excess of $100 billion worth of goods to China in some years. 
Okay, so that was an, a, a statistical overview of uh, relations between China and Levant. For the remaining uh, part of my time, I'd like to uh, present a, a, a regional overview of some of the diplomatic dynamics, some of the cultural dynamics of the relations between China and the uh, Levant region. And I have four points to make with this regard. First, I'm going to compare the relative position of Turkey and Egypt in the Levant region. Uh, Levant also represents the East Eastern Mediterranean, which is connected to um, China's uh, trade and relationship with Europe and the rest of the Mediterranean, and also to uh, areas in the neighborhood, such as Africa and Eurasia. My second point would be about the US reaction to the expansion of these relations. And the third point is about the potential for uh, creating intra-Levant connectivity, because after all, the Belt and Road Initiative is primarily intended to create uh, trade and transshipment connectivity among nations. And last, I will uh, talk about the impact of the pandemic on China's relations with Levant region. First, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, Egypt and Turkey. Based on my um, studies of the bilateral relations of China with Egypt and Turkey, it is my assessment that uh, within the Levant region, China is going to become a more important a Belt and Road Initiative partner for uh, Egypt is going to become a more important uh, partner for China relative to Turkey, although both of them are actively competing to attract Chinese investment. Uh, in Egypt, the reason for this is that uh, we see uh, several major projects that China has undertaken. China is developing the, uh, Middle, the Suez Canal economic zone. It has already invested heavily in what is known as the Teda Suez economic zone, which was dedicated for Chinese investment by the Egyptian government. It is actively, uh, it is the most important uh, foreign participant in development of um, Egypt's new administrative capital. Uh, to the east of Cairo, and it has been the main contractor for developing the second uh, pathway, second uh, Suez Canal. Now Suez Canal is operating both ways. Ships can go in two directions at the same time, which has increased the capacity significantly. So these are some of the examples of how relations between China and Egypt has ex have expanded. Um, uh, so I just wanted to give you an exception. Uh, although most of the contracts that Egypt is awarding are awarded to Chinese firms, and it is actively creating a hospitable environment for Chinese investment, even going as far as uh, offering training in Chinese language uh, for uh, Egyptian workers, uh, there was an exception in September when a um, high speed, uh, the contract for a high speed Red Sea Mediterranean speed rail, high speed railway was awarded to a, a European firm rather than to a Chinese firm. And even those European, the European firm was itself surprised because they didn't think they could outcompete China. So occasionally, Chinese do not get the uh, contracts that they expect. And now in Turkey. Uh, the Turkey's vision for engagement with, with China uh, has accelerated and really uh, uh, taking a very important step forward ever since 2016, 2015. And uh, the vision um, was uh, presented as a, an idea called Center Turkey or Merkez Turkey, which um, imagines that Turkey would be at the center of trade between uh, um, Eurasia, uh, Europe, and uh, Middle East and Africa, uh, so that the program is to develop the uh, trade links, the railways and the highways and the ports in such a way that it plays a central role, central role in the Belt and Road Initiative for the Eastern Mediterranean. 
but it faces several uh, geopolitical and diplomatic challenges. For example, uh, the, the natural path for transport of goods from um, Eurasia, from Central Asia to Turkey is if it comes through Iran and then goes to Turkey. Even though the railway has already been developed because of occasional tensions between Iran and Turkey, this might not be always operational. And Turkey itself is trying to develop another path that's called the middle corridor where goods and uh, goods and products come to the Caspian Sea, they are placed on ships, they are brought to Azerbaijan, the Baku port, and then through the railway that goes through Azerbaijan, Georgia, and into Turkey, they are transferred to and linked to the Turkish railway and highway network. And even here, you can see the impact of geopolitical tensions because the, the shortest path is if it goes through Armenia, but because of tensions between Armenia and Azerbaijan, that is not possible. Another factor that might affect Turkey's relations with China is the question of Uyghurs. Um, there are a group, many activists in Turkey that support the rights of the Uyghur Muslim minority in uh, Western China. Uh, the Turkish government decided to set this issue aside uh, for sake of expanding its relations with uh, China, but the issue can always become political, especially as we move forward towards the um, 2023 presidential election. Okay, so comparing these two countries, uh, first of all, on more important occasions where both countries had faced um, financial crisis because of their heavy debt, China has come to rescue. And China has uh, done that by providing uh, large scale loans and investments in crucial times when the, um, the currency of these two countries was under stress. But China's investments in Egypt are more concentrated. As I mentioned, these are three examples of concentrated large scale Chinese investments. In Turkey, still China plays a crucial role. The most important and the most recent one was when Chinese financing allowed President Erdogan to announce the inauguration of the Suez Canal, which is an alternative to the Bosphorus for connecting the Asian Sea to the Black Sea. So uh, this, the relations are strong with both countries, but we can, in my argument, argue that uh, Egypt will emerge as a um, more important partner relative to Turkey, and even some of the investments that might have been attracted to Turkey are likely to be um, transferred to Egypt. Uh, just a brief comparison in two parameters, production and the role of these countries in logistics and transshipment of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, I argue that in terms of production, uh, Egypt is going to be a, to receive more Chinese investments and the nature of those investments would be more diverse. In Turkey, um, there would be selective um, Chinese investments. We already see that China is uh, partnering with the Turkish firms in some electronic and high-tech areas. Um, and also in development of weapon systems. So it would be narrower, but with more specialized nature. In terms of uh, logistics, uh, shipment and uh, transportation, again, Suez Canal is emerging as far more important than Turkey's Middle Corridor. And we also have to keep in mind that uh, China is uh, developing the Piraeus port in Greece for uh, uh, connection to Europe, which is going to compete with uh, Turkish ports that China is developing. Okay, and the next question is about the uh, connectivity. Unfortunately, the region has so much tension uh, and even conflicts that development of BRI networks um, is not going to increase connectivity among the Levant countries. Instead, I believe we are going to see several parallel BRI paths being developed. 
Uh, Turkey is uh, already successful in developing the middle corridor that I'm showing with the red line here. Um, another potential path that might be developed is the connectivity between Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, Turkey is already active in Syria. It is active in China is already active in Syria, it is active in Iraq. Uh, this is a vision that Iran is aggressively pushing, uh, but it, is, uh, it faces high political risks because the United States and Israel, as many are aware, are uh, disrupting this land connectivity between Iran, Iraq, and Syria, and they would significantly resist this development. Although this uh, is connection is referred to as the axis of resistance by Iran and its supporters in this region. But Suez Canal is likely to be the main path. So um, this gray line shows potential for connectivity in Levant. And I unfortunately, I think unless we see significant improvement in the um, geopolitics of the region, this is unlikely to be realized. Uh, the third point is about U.S. pushback. We have witnessed in the past five years that the United States has expressed concern about Chinese investments in many countries. They have pressed Europeans to scale back. They have pressed Pakistan. And they, they have also, um, the, the United States has pressed Israel to scale back. And those um, pressures by the United States have been successful. Israel, Israel's relations with um, China have been affected by that and they are below what they could have been without uh, Israeli uh, respect for uh, US concern. This, Israeli, this US pushback in Israel is primarily focused on high-tech cooperation between Israel and China uh, and the participation of Chinese uh, high-tech firms such as Huawei telecommunications firm in development of the 5G um, connectivity and uh, cell phone services in Israel. Uh, it is my assessment that Israel and Jordan, because of their strong relations with the United States, will uh, respond to US demands for curtailing their relations with China whenever that demand is expressed. Egypt receives Egyptian US aid, uh, but the uh, impact of US on Egypt would be partial uh, because Egypt is also facing US uh, sanctions and the relationship has been tarnished by a US concern about uh, human rights violations in that country. Um, Lebanon has a fragmented uh, political system. Some groups advocate better relations with Europe and some groups such as Hezbollah, which is supported by Iran, actively advocate uh, closer ties with China. Uh, Turkey is interesting because Turkey is likely to uh, play bargaining game as it has done in the past uh, 10 years. Um, and it most likely is moving gradually towards China, but uh, it is willing to negotiate with the United States. Uh, one of the unique features of Turkish uh, foreign policy is its uh, flexibility and oscillation uh, among various groups. And finally, China, Syria, which has been a target of uh, uh, even uh, US hostility ever since the civil war began, is, is eagerly the Syrian uh, leadership, uh, Bashar Assad, is eager to expand ties with China. Uh, so uh, the US will not have any leverage on, uh, on Syria in this graph. And I'll be happy to go into more details about this in the um, Q&A if there are any uh, questions. Um, in my view, the tensions between the United States and uh, um, China in the Levant region uh, are not going to be directly forward against each other as shown by this uh, picture which is often depicted of the uh, rising Cold War, rather there might be a 90 degree confrontation where China is more focused on geoeconomics, but it is willing to create a space for 
the United States to continue its security and military relationship because that relationship creates a stability for the region and China benefits from that. And China has been reluctant to directly uh, confront US, but rather uh, prefers to focus on economic relations uh, as much as possible. But this might change moving forward because uh, the tensions between US and, the, and China are on the rise. And finally, I'll stop with just a brief explanation about the pandemic. Um, pandemic caused disruption in the Belt and Road Initiative projects all over the world, as China itself was um, involved trying to handle the issue domestically. Uh, but as, uh, as soon as China was able to uh, put its own house domestically in order, it began uh, sending massive amounts of aid to the rest of the world and uh, Levant countries have received aid. It also began to cooperate with both Turkey and uh, Egypt and, uh, and Israel as well in developing the vaccine and even tests. Um, the impact of the pandemic is that in the short run, it has, as we saw in the statistics, reduced the economic engagement with Levant. But uh, I think uh, the relationship will rebound and uh, the expansion will continue in the future. Pandemic has become an excuse for introduction of uh, two new directions in China's cooperation with the rest of the world and also with Levant. Uh, that is that in the, the initial projects in the uh, Belt and Road Initiative were primarily large scale infrastructure, building ports, building roads and railways. Now, uh, China is focusing on uh, helping uh, partner countries develop their healthcare system, and uh, also um, using this opportunity to expand their uh, uh, high-tech technologies such as telecommunications, which has become more important during the pandemic, especially for uh, remote education and uh, uh, remote marketing and shopping, all kinds of online activities. So we see that, for example, Huawei uh, is active in Egypt, in uh, um, Syria, in many countries developing their uh, telecommunication network. Another Chinese firm, ZTE, is cooperating with, uh, partnering with the uh, Turkish firm in developing their uh, uh, telecommunication products and cell, uh, cell phones and things similar to that. Uh, therefore, uh, pandemic has become an excuse for introduction of uh, two new sectors as priority sectors for China's engagement with the Levant region. So um, I think with this, I'd like to stop uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Habibi. I, I found that your uh, remarks uh, uh, were a mirror, uh, not only for understanding in the thorough presentation of, on the Levant, but for instance, in the way the structural relationships, uh, how that might, might apply to other regions of the world as well. For instance, in Europe to the 16 or 17 plus one and uh, the na bilateral nature of the relationships and so forth. So I think that your, your analytical framework actually has uh, a, a broader application than for the Levant. But uh, today we'll concentrate on the Levant. And uh, Dr. Jafar, uh, I'd like you to join with uh, some comments. Uh, and uh, I don't think that Sophie Zinzer has been able to join us yet uh, from Singapore. Uh, so uh, we'll leave the uh, discussant remarks to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Grant. It's a, it's a real honor to be here with you and thank you for organizing. And it's great to be uh, with my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor uh, Habibi. Uh, I have, uh, uh, I've, I've read the paper thoroughly and I really, really uh, uh, enjoyed it. Uh, I think one of the, the key strengths of uh, uh, the paper that it's actually one of its uh, one of the first kind that would focus on specifically on on the Levant. Uh, and much of the work, as Professor Hadi mentioned, tends to focus on uh, North Africa, which which I work on, uh, and of course the Gulf. And there are not many papers out there that do focus. Uh, on the Levant, so definitely the, the paper uh, fills uh, a gap 
uh, there. Uh, another unique aspect is the, the, the comparative lens, uh, which I really enjoyed uh, looking at uh, the different countries. I think where the paper really shines uh, is when it comes to the Turkey-Egypt comparison, uh, as, uh, as those countries out of all of the ones uh, that are studied are the ones that are lend lend themselves more to uh, to uh, to a much to a multi dimensional uh, comparative analysis. So I really enjoyed that the angle of the uh, the Turkey Egypt uh, com comparison. Uh, the paper also has uh, lots of rich data, so it's uh, it uses a combination of uh, qualitative uh, and quantitative uh, approaches which uh, make, makes it much, uh, much uh, richer. Uh, I also appreciated that uh, look, uh, the, the paper looked at the geostrategic uh, aspects and uh, the relationship of various countries vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the, the US. Uh, and as Professor Habibi mentioned, uh, this is a key differentiator when we really look at China in the region because uh, when uh, uh, the Chinese come, they, they come without baggage. Uh, they come and say, we were not part of the colonial era. We are actually have, uh, have had relations with uh, the Middle East and Arab countries uh, since the post-colonial era have, have supported these countries. Uh, so they, they come uh, without that colonial baggage, which definitely uh, 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 helps them uh, doing business in, uh, in the region. Uh, I think so uh, another uh, advantage uh, the China has is the uh, top-down decision making uh, uh, in 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 China, which allows for uh, for faster uh, movement of policy and allows for consistent uh, policy vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, for example, uh, the U.S. or various European countries, where uh, uh, governments change and policies change. Uh, China uh, tends to have. Uh, a more consistent approach, and if uh, you have read uh, the uh, the China, uh, the foreign ministry had uh, published a, an Arab position paper in 2016, which outlines China's multilateral and bilateral cooperation mechanisms with uh, the Arab world. Uh, you you definitely uh, you definitely see that. Uh, so, uh, in terms of the paper itself, these are some of the highlights which I really enjoyed. I do have six points specifically uh, that perhaps would help Professor Habibi uh, 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 sh sharpen uh, uh, the paper. Uh, first, uh, in the bilateral section, I think it, it's, it's very interesting and builds on what I spoke about and, and the Arab uh, policy paper published by, by the Chinese policymakers. I think we also uh, the paper needs to differentiate between the types of bilateral diplomacy uh, that China uses in in the region uh, because there are there are actually two there are strategic part partnerships or SPs and comprehensive strategic uh, partnerships uh, or CSPs. So, for example, uh, Egypt has a comprehensive comprehensive strategic partnership, Algeria uh, and Iran, uh, but uh, Iraq, Jordan, uh, Morocco. Uh, uh, and uh, indeed Turkey only have strategic partnerships. So uh, what characterizes a comprehensive strategic partnership is that it involves a higher level of institutional communication, including regular high level meetings between top leadership members of both partner countries. Uh, there has to be political trust between countries, uh, dense economic ties, cultural exchanges and good relations in, in various uh, uh, sections. So the, the comprehensive strategic partnership really demonstrates how China and states in the region uh, have strengthened their diplo diplomatic and economic and cultural relations. And indeed, Turkey does not have one, but actually is seeking to have a comprehensive uh, strategic partnership with China. So again, highlighting this, that, this aspect in the bilateral section would, would be beneficial for uh, the region. The second aspect is uh, that the paper could, could benefit from is focusing on Chinese debt. So definitely China, as the paper mentions, does lend to many of the countries in the region, but the, 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 that uh, debt is, uh, tends to be of opaque nature. Now, of course, we're all familiar with uh, uh, the so-called debt traps and people uh, and many scholars uh, have various approaches to these uh, debt traps, but as it is a fact, the Chinese debt in areas from Ecuador uh, to uh, to uh, 
places like Pakistan has definitely had an impact on, on, on local economies. So I, I think the paper should also address that, especially when it comes to Egypt and the building of the new capital. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not very clear what are the terms of the debt. Uh, and much of the financial dealings tend to be very opaque uh, in, in comparative to, uh, to uh, other international lenders or the World Bank or, or the IMF. So this is the second point that the paper could, should uh, elaborate on in terms of the debt diplomacy. A third angle, which is not covered, uh, is uh, it's also economic, is tourism. And tourism, Chinese tourism, uh, Chinese outbound tourism is, uh, is a huge, is, is, is basically the biggest market in the world with 150 million travelers. Of course, the growing middle class in China uh, has uh, gave opportunity for more people to travel. Uh, and actually, Egypt used to uh, have a big, uh, a lot of Chinese travelers. Uh, but since 2011 and the uh, uprising, there's been less tourism. But in the last five years, especially uh, tourism has picked up back in Egypt to almost to pre-2011 numbers. And actually, a lot of the tourism uh, in Egypt had went to Turkey because Turkey uh, is also a competitor in Egypt in, in terms of uh, tourism and, and bringing tourists to, to the region. So I think uh, in, in the comparison, perhaps also looking at tourist numbers uh, and, 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 uh, and tourist spend uh, uh, is, is another angle to look at in terms of the uh, economic uh, uh, angle. I really appreciated uh, uh, Professor Habibi's uh, discussion on, on COVID diplomacy. That's my fourth my my fourth point. I think the the COVID diplomacy angle should be flushed out. And, and as you mentioned, of course, in Egypt there's there was there's a plan to produce uh, Chinese vaccines also uh, uh, in, uh, in in Morocco, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, now the UAE already manufactures uh, 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 Chinese vaccines. So again, re-elaborating. Uh, on uh, on the vaccine diplomacy uh, angle and the health uh, uh, road uh, Silk Road uh, angle would be excellent to, to elaborate on the paper. Now that I've heard Professor Habibi uh, speak about it, I have a much better understanding. So I think using some of that material in the paper would really uh, flush flush that material out. My fifth point uh, is uh, I think the paper also does not really speak about uh, people to people links, uh, and I think these are important because. Uh, both countries, uh, both sides of the relationships have to have also worked on that. And uh, that's a, a, an aspect that the, the Chinese uh, uh, partners have focused on, for example, opening Chinese language centers uh, in, in a number of these countries, uh, Confucius uh, centers as, uh, as well. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, countries such as Egypt and, and Turkey have also sent their students to China uh, to attend Chinese universities and have scholarships. Uh, and have opened the, the departments or invested invested heavily in the departments that study Chinese in various universities. So again, looking at the people to people link uh, would, would be would, would be beneficial for the comparative uh, angle. Uh, and finally, uh, my sixth and final uh, point is uh, how will all of these countries balance uh, uh, the uh, growing US uh, China uh, rivalry? Uh, I think uh, Professor Habibi highlighted some of this in, 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 his dis in his discussion, but I think this should be flushed out a bit more uh, in, in, in the paper. Uh, there's been lots of talk about uh, the US pivoting to Asia uh, uh, and perhaps uh, and, and, and leaving the Middle East and so on. But to date, the US remains the uh, main un uh, security underwriter, especially when it comes to the, the Gulf. Uh, region and I think China ca can be characterized uh, in the literature as a security free rider. Uh, and as the Chinese role uh, grows, uh, it, it, there's a big debate in Chinese policy circles on how to play or whether they should play a bigger security role. So again, how all of these countries will balance uh, the, the the rivalry with the, with the U.S. Uh, and I think uh, Turkey, for example, is part of NATO. And of course, there's been challenging uh, Turkey-US relations, but still, uh, uh, this is pretty still very important for Turkey, as it is for uh, for Egypt. A lot of uh, the, the assistance that comes from the US is a military, and lots of uh, Egyptian weapons are, are tailored towards uh, US uh, uh, armaments and so on. So it'll be, it'll be increasingly challenging for uh, the countries uh, that we have discussed here uh, on how to balance with the relationship with the US moving forward. So again, elaborating, flushing that out in the paper uh, a bit more would be uh, excellent. And that is my, uh, those are my six points.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jafar, for those uh, insightful uh, comments uh, and critiques. And uh, I, we have about 15 minutes left, 14 minutes left. Uh, and uh, Dr. Habibi, would you like to just say a few words in response, and then uh, we'll move on to uh, the first question that's come in from, uh, from Dan Weissman. Sure, um, Adil, thank you very much. Those uh, six points are well taken. Uh, I prepared my remarks for about 20 minutes, so I couldn't address those. I thought maybe I just choose selective numbers so that I can speak in more detail on each uh, topic. But I, I fully agree with you um, on, on those issues, um, especially tourism, for example, where uh, both uh, Turkey and Egypt are planning actively, proactively, for attraction of uh, Chinese tourism. And it's interesting that uh, Chinese investments in Turkey include a large number of hotels and resort areas with the anticipation that they would uh, also benefit from the growing tourism in, in that the country. Um, with respect to other issues that you meant, with respect to debt, um, yes, I agree that the China is uh, providing funding and that could uh, lead to a risk, uh, a, a debt trap risk for these countries. But if you look at the literature on debt trap, um, there are two um, diverging opinions. One group of uh, scholars believe that this is going to cause a crisis and the others who say no, the, uh, the um, there has been exaggeration in uh, assessing the risk of debt trap. Um, when, we, when you look at the overall debt of Turkey, for example, uh, the largest lenders are still Europeans and China is a, a small part of that. And I think the uh, strong bilateral engagement itself uh, creates a leverage for the borrowing firms in order to manage the debt if there is a a crisis. The opaqueness of the uh, contracts between China and uh, BRI Belt and Road Partners has been well documented in a recent study that I recommend to the audience by two scholars from the College of William and Mary. It just came out. It looks at a large number of Chinese loans. And uh, wh what they find is that uh, the, the real issue is not so much that the debt has caused the significant uh, payment crisis, but rather the opaqueness and the secretiveness of those agreements where the, uh, the details, uh, the contracts require that the partners do not reveal the details of the cooperation and that creates suspension, uh, suspicion about uh, the, the, the key vulnerabilities that are not being exposed. Um, I, I, I don't think at this point the countries, the governments at least, in these Levant countries are significantly worried about the issue of debt trap. They are just so eager for the Chinese capital because in the short run, as I mentioned, its benefits outweigh the potential risk that we might face. In both countries, Egypt and Turkey, which are the largest ones, the macroeconomic risks are significant. And even uh, the potential for backlash to heavy reliance on uh, Chinese investments. Uh, and Chinese investments in Turkey, such as the Istanbul Canal, are already controversial for human rights reasons. Uh, and in, in Egypt, uh, if this massive focus on uh, infrastructure has caused some resentment because less money is being spent on uh, income support programs. So it is an issue, but uh, for now, uh, the priority is to attract Chinese investment. I'll stop here so we have time for Q&A. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll go uh, ahead with this question from uh, Dan Weissman at Harvard. How did China navigate the political complexities of doing business with governments fighting internal conflicts in the Levant region? China's policy of non-intervention in internal affairs seems like a non-starter in that region and a good way to become targeted by non-state actors fighting against government forces. Uh, for example, doing business with Syrian or Israeli governments seems tantamount to taking a side 
in their respective internal conflicts? Yes. So a, a complex question. Sure, yes, thank you so much. Uh, that, that is, I think, a Chinese skill or Chinese art that they, they manage to navigate among conflicting groups. Um, in, in many of these countries, the governments that make deals with China have significant strong domestic opposition. But keep in mind that they keep moving forward. And also what we have seen is that even when you have a power shift in one of these countries where political system is sort of uh, turned upside down, such as the Arab Spring in Egypt, uh, there is a tendency to maintain good relations with China. Uh, China had good relations with Hosni Mubarak. Uh, Chinese-Egyptian relations began with Hosni Mubarak. When he was toppled, China immediately focused on developing relations with uh, Mohammed Morsi, the temporary democratic president of Egypt. And when he was toppled by current president al-Sisi and the army, uh, Egyptian interest in China continued. So you've had regime changes, but all commit, committed to expanding relations with China. And this is um, precisely because all along China never took side in, in this conflict. Um, so that's that's part of the reason. In the Arab-Israeli conflict, again, we see that China is playing both sides. Uh, I think Chinese assess that the risk of uh, um, being uh, punished for this neutrality is very low because even if there is a regime change, they would still be able to continue the relations with the other regime, except when there is complete um, collapse uh, of uh, governance, which is what happened in, uh, in Libya. In case of Syria, uh, China was cautious for a few years, but now that they are uh, sort of beginning to believe that the regime is stable uh, because of the uh, Russian and Iranian commitment, and they are becoming more proactive in uh, investing in that country as well. Uh, they always factor in a number of uh, political risks in their investments all around the world. Dr. Jafar, do you have any uh, comment to add? Uh, I have one uh, small question that I could ask if, uh, if we can move on. No, I, I, I completely agree with Professor Halibi and yeah, the, the, the clear examples of, of, of that are, uh, are Libya and, and Syria. I think uh, uh, China is is waiting on the sidelines uh, and wants to be part of the reconstruction effort in both Libya uh, and and in Syria, uh, but is is not going to uh, step in, uh, take any uh, take sides uh, and maintains uh, co connections to all, to all sides in the, uh, and is just awaiting the end of the conflict to be able to to both conflicts to to play uh, to play uh, to play a role. So I completely agree with Professor uh, Hadidi on, on that front. Okay, well, let me uh, wrap up the questioning with maybe two uh, questions. Uh, one is, uh, is about uh, uh, the competition between uh, Egypt and, and Turkey and, and uh, the, the port of Comport in Turkey. And uh, um, Professor Habibi, do you, do you see that the, uh, the freight that's going through Comport is actually a transshipment of freight coming up through the Suez Canal or is it mostly uh, coming across the middle corridor and uh, in other words, I, I'm just wondering uh, uh, about in terms of this uh, choice of uh, corridors that, that you laid out very clearly at the end of your presentation, uh, where, where the Turkish uh, port situation lies. And uh, my second uh, question actually has to do about uh, maybe the future of Haifa and uh, that as a, uh, uh, you know, a model for US uh, uh, competition with China. And uh, it strikes me that maybe Haifa is a little bit more like, uh, European uh, relations than, than perhaps Levant relations uh, overall, but uh, I, that uh, with this uh, um, idea of the, uh, uh, the debt trap, uh, the Israelis seem to have uh, very much be, uh, be playing their bets to, to use Chinese investment without a debt trap, and whether or not this might be a larger model for, for countries uh, involved in the, in, the, in the BRI and other parts of the world. Okay, Th thank you. Um, so with respect to uh, uh, the Comport port, 
Um, clearly, given uh, the development of the higher speed railway and highways uh, that go east-west throughout Turkey, and their connection to Baku, now we practically have that corridor functioning. Uh, for that corridor to be beneficial for Turkey to uh, support trade beyond its own borders, so that it becomes transshipment to trade, it needs a number of well-developed ports, including Kampo. But the value of Kampo is limited precisely because uh, aside from serving the middle corridor that goes through Turkey, it might not be of much benefit to others. For example, transshipments that come through Suez Canal for connection to Europe, uh, the question is, will they choose Piraeus in Greece for Comport, uh, I think Piraeus might have an advantage. Now, if the uh, second Suez Canal is developed, um, then we might have an increased logistic value in Comport for a trade with the Black Sea through that second uh, Suez Canal. Um, right now, the middle corridor connectivity is functioning, and it's not just limited to Comport, but there are uh, several uh, Turkish ports uh, in Eastern Mediterranean, closer to Southern Turkey and Syrian border region, which can also, which are already um, operational. With respect to the um, Haifa port, um, yes, US uh, is very concerned because US um, military naval ships stop in Haifa, and even they have exercises with Israel, which they are worried about the uh, potential for Chinese firms that operate that port uh, to engage in espionage. And uh, because of that, uh, we, we know that they have been, uh, uh, they have convinced Israeli security uh, forces to uh, be more watchful and even in terms of the technology that is being used and monitoring Chinese activity. And that's, Haifa is not the only port that um, China is developing. There is the port of Ashtad as well. And they also have a project for a high-speed railway connecting the um, port of Haifa all the way to uh, the Iliad in uh, Red Sea, the, the Israeli port that connects to Agabat and uh, Red Sea. Um, so um, the reason Israel is not um, worried about debt trap is that Israel actually is successful in exporting products to China. There are many uh, Israeli products, especially high-tech uh, products, military products that uh, China would like to buy. If other Middle Eastern countries had products that could compete in Chinese uh, market, other than oil and natural gas, obviously the trade deficit would have been uh, addressed. But the, the question of that trap depends on the overall performance of an economy and its ability to generate enough external revenue to finance the debt. So we should not limit it to the amount of bilateral trade. Israeli economy is overall strong and they enjoy significant surplus with US, which um, re reduces the risk of uh, uh, any kind of debt trap with uh, China. It's practically non-existent as far as Israel, in my opinion. Okay, well, I uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And I, I'm gonna have to wrap it up uh, uh, at this point. Uh, but for more on this subject, uh, I recommend that those who are attending have a look at the profiles of our speakers on their university websites and note their extensive uh, related publications on a broad range of topics on the Middle East, especially in relation to China. I'll mention that Dr. Jafar has just published a book on China and North Africa between economics, politics, and the security. And uh, this topic actually uh, relates to our topic two weeks from today, uh, when uh, Lena ben, Abdul ben Abdullah and Michael Valdemariam will present on Chinese and French capital networks in North Africa. In closing, let me say thank you to all of you who joined us for this virtual event. And a special thanks to Professors Habibi and Jafar. And uh, we're sorry that uh, Sophie Zinzer was unable to join us from Singapore. We don't know if it's been uh, technical problems. 
uh, and uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Jafar, Jafar has turned in from uh, Eastern Australia, so it's now well after midnight for him, one o'clock in the morning. So we appreciate uh, and give him the, uh, the scheduled hardship prize for this series. Our appreciation goes to the Global Development Policy Center and the Center for the Study of Asia for co-sponsoring this event and to Xin Yue Ma for recording the talk. The recording of this event will be posted on the website of the Party School of Global Studies on the webpage with the series label, Assessing China's Belt and Road Initiative. I'm Grant Road of the Party School at BU. Glad that you have joined us today for this thought-provoking BRI fall semester discussion on the Levant region. Thank you all very much for participating today.